This is a comparison of humans in Pathfinder 2nd Edition and Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Humans are pretty familiar to anyone watching this video, so I'm going to start with the lore to show what sets humans in the fantasy world apart from, well, you and me. In Pathfinder's Galarian setting, humans began as an unremarkable primitive race. Early on, aboliths, yes, the aboliths from your favorite bestiary, started enhancing human abilities, inspiring or compelling them to stop with their aimless nomadic lifestyle and settle into civilization. For thousands of years, these advanced versions of humans flourished in the form of the Aslanti Empire, but eventually they began to believe themselves superior to their Abolith masters, and as a result, the Aboliths performed a ritual that caused stones to fall from the sky, pummeling Galarian and destroying the Aslanti people. The greatest stone to fall was the Star Stone, which remained buried underwater until 1 AR when Aradin caused it to raise from the ocean, forming an island where he founded the great city of Absalon. Even today, the Star Stone remains a powerful holy relic on Galarian and the object of a deadly test that grants mortals godhood upon completion. In D&D's Forgotten Realms setting, the early world of Abir Toril endured a great war between gods and primordials, after which there began the Days of Thunder. During this era, a few different races were born, and they in turn created new races. These so-called creator races were the Saruk, that's the scaly kind like lizard folk, Naga, Yuan-Ti, the Eri, those are the bird folk such as Kenku and Arakokra, the Fae, pixies and nymphs, the Batrachi, Kuatoa, Bullywugs, and humans. They didn't create anything as they were still just primitive cave people. So humans existed and developed in the background of the world while lots of major events happened, like a war between giants and dragons, the crown wars of the elves, and in the wake of this turmoil, there was eventually relative peace, and humans then started to come out of the caves and started to form tribes and civilizations for themselves. The Amaskar Empire, or Rarin Empire, after the plateau where it was formed, was ruled by wizard kings. The humans of this empire were the ancestors of the modern Mulan human subrace, which is an option in the player's handbook. Empires rise and fall, of course, but humanity as a race had come into its own. Ability scores. In 5e, you get a plus one to each ability score, but there's a 5e variant human option where you can take instead a plus one to two different ability scores, and you gain one skill proficiency and one feat of your choice. In Pathfinder 2, a plus two to two abilities of your choice. In 5e, ability scores are determined by dice rolls or by assigning a standard array of numbers to your stats. A boost is granted by your choice of race. In Pathfinder 2, ability scores start at 10 and accumulate boosts and penalties according to the choices you make for your character, including your ancestry. It's worthy of note, I think, that humans in Pathfinder 2 don't get a flaw. They just get the plus two to two abilities of your choice. Speed. In 5th edition, 30 feet. In Pathfinder 2nd edition, 25 feet. 25 feet is the most common speed in Pathfinder 2nd edition, while 30 feet is the most common speed for D&D 5th edition. Heritages. 5e has nine ethnicities. They don't call them subraces in this context. And that reflects different regions of Faerun. None of them get any special traits, though, so I'm not going to just list terms that, that don't have an effect on mechanics. Pathfinder 2 has two heritages, half-elf and half-orc. I'll cover half-elf and half-orc in their own separate videos because 5th edition treats them as distinct races. If you choose half-elf or half-orc, then you get heritage specific to each of those. Otherwise, you can choose between skilled and versatile heritage. Skilled heritage. Your ingenuity allows you to train at a wide variety of skills. You become trained in one skill of your choice. At 5th level, you become an expert in that chosen skill. Versatile Heritage. Select a general feat of your choice for which you meet the prerequisites. Health Points. 5th edition. Hit points aren't assigned by race. So you get nothing! You lose! 
Good day, sir! In Pathfinder 2, you get 8 hit points, and it's going to get boosted later on when you choose your class. Ancestry Feats. In Pathfinder, you get an Ancestry Feat at first level. There are several to choose from. Adapted Cantrip. You've studied magic, you get a cantrip. Cooperative nature. You get a plus four to aid checks, which is an attempt to grant a bonus to an ally's skill or attack roll. General training. You get a first level general feat. Haughty obstinacy. You get a bonus against mental control effects. Natural ambition. Gain a first level class feat. Natural skill. Gain the trained proficiency rank in two skills of your choice. Unconventional weaponry. Choose an uncommon simple or martial weapon with a trait corresponding to an ancestry or that's common in another culture. Gain access to that weapon and treat it as a simple weapon when determining proficiency. In 5th edition, this flexibility is provided by the variant human option where you gain a skill proficiency and a feat. It's called a variant human because it grants a feat, which is considered an optional rule in 5th edition. That's all there is to humans, and I think this, this shows how, how diverse humanity is supposed to be in this fantasy world. Humans are seen as excellent generalists. They don't do any one thing very well, but they do a lot of things well enough. You don't go to a human market to find amazing swords. You go to the elves for that. You don't visit human cities to look at their architecture. You go to the dwarves for that. But talk to a human when you want your choice between uh, 80 romance novels that are basically the same story with different costumes, cheap cutlery and dinnerware, and some silk flowers because you can't be bothered to water your houseplants. Humans are relatively short-lived as well, but they reproduce often enough to make up for it. And, and finally, humans are dreamers. They get excited about weird things. They obsess over details nobody cares about. They, they fall deeply in love. They're hot-headed. They're difficult. They're capable of great good, and sadly also of great evil. It may seem strange and almost self-congratulatory to have humans in a game that lets you escape to a fantasy world. The fantasy world populated by nothing but mystical races like elves and gnomes is genuinely fantastic to you and me, the real humans, looking at it from outside. But in a role-playing game, you're not meant to look at the world from outside. You're meant to pretend you're actually a part of that world and to interpret and react to it from that perspective. With that in mind, a fantasy world with nothing but elves and gnomes is by definition mundane, normal. If everyone around you has pointed ears, then pointed ears aren't called pointed ears anymore. They're just ears. To make it possible for players to react to a fantasy world with wonderment and fear, you have to establish what's mundane in that world. The easiest and most effective way to establish that baseline is to populate your world with plain, ordinary, boring humans. That's our real-life race, and we know there's nothing magical about it from daily experience. The more mundane humans your world has in it, the more fantastical and magical and mystical and strange the other races become. I'll cover more ancestries later. For now, that's humans. Thanks for watching.